let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring our hearts to your theater house. We're asking and praying that we carry out a divine surgical operation upon our hearts. Every blemish, every stain, every hardiness, cut them all off from our hearts in Jesus' name. Make us pure in hearts. So we'll be able to see you. Both here on earth and in eternity. Help us to see you and to be in fellowship with you in Jesus' name. You are a holy God. And you reside in holy heaven. And you have given us a holy book. And the angels in heaven are holy. Everything about you, everything around you is holy. Only holy people We see your face. Lord, we ask that this day, whatever it will cost you to make our heart purified and pure and righteous and holy, we pray, spare no effort, go ahead, do it in our lives, in Jesus' name. Two cannot work together except they be agreed. And only boss of the same feather will flock together to take a holy people to live with the holy God. We're asking and praying that this morning, I mean this evening, it will sanctify our hearts and make us entirely pure and holy and righteous and unblameable, true and true in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, that we will not seek you in vain. We will not serve you in vain. We will not preach in vain. We will not go to church in vain. We will not pay tithe and offering in vain. Lord, we will not attend night Fiji in vain. Lord, we ask and pray that you will help us. That's our lives will be acceptable unto you. And our services will be acceptable as well. Do the work in our hearts now. For we lay bare before you. Have your way, O oh Lord. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We open to Matthew chapter 5. There in verse 8, we see that the Corinthians have already preached the message that we are considering together. Here are the words of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 5, reading verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall I see God. The comfort of it is also true. Cursed are the unpure in heart, for they shall not see God. Today we are considering together the message holiness, the key that opens heaven's doors. Holiness, the key that opens heaven's door. When we talk about holiness, holiness is God's essential nature. God is holy, and in Him is no sin. Holiness talks about sinlessness. That's holiness. If you are asking, what's the meaning of holiness? And I answer you, sinlessness. 
absence of sin. So then, if there is no sin in my life, I am holy. But if there is sin in my life, I am unholy. And remember, just a stain of sin is enough to remove, to cancel holiness. What is holiness? Holiness means godliness. Since God is holy, then if I am like God, it means I am holy. If I am unlike God, it means I am unholy. If in my conduct, in my character, in my behavior, in my actions, in my reactions, in my inactions, if I am unlike God, then I am unholy. But if I am like God, then I am holy. What is holiness? Definition number three. Holiness is Christ-likeness. Oh, you say, what is the difference? The difference is that nobody has ever seen God. I'm preaching to you about, G, about, you know, about, about God. I've never seen him. But as for Christ, he came to this world. He saw John here on earth. People saw him. Even though I've never seen him, some people saw him. And they penned down the account of his deeds for us in the scripture to read and meditate about. So if I study about the life of Jesus, I read about the life of Jesus, if I am like Christ, then I am holy. If I am unlike Christ, then I am unholy. Jesus put on the form of a man. He had human appetites like you and I. He preached like I'm doing. He was hungry like many of us do hunger. He was thirsty. He felt tired. He even slept like you and I do. So in my lifestyle, if I am like him, then I am holy. If I am unlike him, then I am unholy. Holiness. The essential nature of God. And from the topic of our consideration, the key, holiness, the key that opens heaven's doors. We see that there is a special connection God establishes with a man or woman that receives grace for a holy heart and life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Holiness grants access to heaven, both in time and in eternity. You have access. When you kneel down on your knees and you are praying, doing your money devotion, or what we call quiet time, if you are a holy God, I and mean if you are a holy man, a holy woman, the moment you kneel down like this, heaven's doors are open. You know, gospel preachers, they organize these programs, and they say, open heavens. Hmm. I pray God will grant it to us. But without holiness, there is no hope in heaven. Heaven will never open for an unholy man. Forget about that. We may caption the program with, uh, you know, scriptural terminologies and all that. We will be doing all that in vain if we are not holy. If you are a holy man, once you kneel down, you are praying, or you stand up, or you are praying, the moment you say, our Father who art in heaven, heaven opens immediately. You have access to heaven here in time. And by the time we leave this world, you are ushered to the immediate presence of God. That's a holy man. That's a holy woman. That's a king in the Bible. 
Ezekiah by name. You can read about him later. Second Kings chapter 20. From verses 1, from verse 1 to 6. King Ezekiah came face to face with his moment of truth when he received news of his imminent death from an authentic source. Isaiah the prophet has gone to prophesy to him. Set your house in order. For you shall surely die. You will not live. Isaiah was not a, an ordinary prophet. He was a classical prophet in his own time. He never misses it. Once he says it, it is guaranteed. Because he spoke the mind of God all the time. So Isaiah came to him and he said, King Ezekiah, set your house in order. Time with you is up. You won't live again. Ezekiah knew that this prophet is not, it's not a, it's a no-nonsense prophet. Immediately that man turned to God. And he said, oh God, remember how I've lived with you, with uprightness, with a clean heart, with a pure mind, how I've not departed from, your, from the words of your mouth and all that. And he cried, and he prayed unto God. And right on the spot. Because King Ezekiah was a holy man. The same prophet that prophesied his death. That same prophet was commanded to go back. And reverse that death sentence pronounced upon Ezekiah. And had dead unto him 15 good years. My point of interest in that is this. Ezekiah could have pleaded on, so many, on many grounds. He could have pleaded on the ground that, look, I'm of the descendant of David, and you have promised David that uh, his seed will be on the throne forever, you know, in Israel. In Ezekiah knew he would be wasting his time if he pleaded on that ground. He could have said, oh Lord, remember, I don't have a son that will take over me if I die now. Because as at that time, Manasseh has not yet been born. He hasn't been born. When Manasseh began to reign, he was 13 years old. And you remember, uh, Ezekiah was, 15 years was added to the life of Ezekiah. So which means, as at the time death sentence was pronounced on Ezekiah, Manasseh has not been born. So if he had died at that time, probably there wouldn't have been a son from his lineage to take over, you know, the throne. Ezekiah could have pleaded that. And said, look, all my children are females. I don't have a man child that will take over from me. And so God, I will, let me not die now. If Ezekiah has pleaded on that ground, he will have failed woefully. But what was the ground upon which Ezekiah pleaded for sustainability of his, of his life? He said, remember? I'm an upright, upright man. I've walked before you with pure heart. Immediately, heaven opened. An answer, you know, came down. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they, as I see God. And immediately God told him, I've heard your prayer. And all that, I'm having 15 more years. God of heaven has great respect unto holiness. Bible says, though God be high, yet at he respect to those who are, who are lowly. And lowliness is an attribute of uh, holiness. Proverbs chapter 22, I read in verse 11. Proverbs Chapter 22, verse 11. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his leaves, the king shall be his friend. Church, I'm asking you, which king is being referred to here? Eh? Is he referring to kings of this heart? Uh-uh. The kings of this earth don't have respect for those who have pureness of heart. The kings, of, the kings in Nigeria 
Do they have regard for holiness of life? No, they are looking for those who will flatter them, who will play along with them in corruption and uh, you know and all that. They don't have uh, any interest in in, uh, in 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 holiness. But he's talking about the King of Kings and the laws of laws. So he says, "He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lip, the King singular shall be his friend." If you want God to be your friend. Holiness of life and heart is the answer. If you are not holy, forget about it. There are three points I'm looking at in the message. Point number one. The true and essential beginning of a holy life. Point number two. The total and enduring beauty of a holy life. Point number three, the temporal and eternal benefits of a holy life. Let's look at point number one, the true and essential beginning of a holy life. Second Corinthians chapter one, I read verses eight and nine. Second Corinthians chapter one, reading verses eight and nine. For we will not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had this sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which resets the dead. I read First Thessalonians chapter four, verse seven. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse seven. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? Unto holiness. First Peter chapter 1. I read verses 14 to 16. First Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves after the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written. Be ye holy, for I am holy. In chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous life which in time past were not a people but now the people of god which had not ob obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy dearly beloved i beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul salvation is a fairy foundation and the essential beginning of a holy life. At salvation, there is a measure of holiness deposited in the believer. Before salvation, sin reigns supreme in the heart of man. But at salvation, holiness begins. A holy life a life free from sin harass the new life of saved souls. That's what we find in Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Romans chapter 6, reading there in verse 22. 
The Bible says, but now, be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Believers are called unto holiness. Therefore, the highway of holiness stretches from salvation through to sanctification and glorification. When you are saved from sin, holiness of life begins. You grow in that holiness experience and you get sanctified. When you are sanctified, you begin to live a holy life until eventually you are glorified. That is, you leave this world and you get to heaven. I pray you will get there in Jesus' name. I need to tell you that heaven is holy and no unclean thing we enter there. As I said in prayer, God is holy. Jesus Christ is holy. The Holy Ghost from that name is holy. So the divine trinity is holy. Then this holy God inhabits a holy heaven. In the midst of holy angels, on the streets of pure gold, signifying holiness. And he has given us a book here on earth. If you have that book, and I see you raise it up, you have this book there. Please permit me to ask you what is written on that book. Answer me. That's what's written on my own too. Holy Bible. And this Holy Bible contains many, many holy things. In it, we read about holy angels. We read about holy censors. We read about holy tabernacle. We read about many, many holy things. So the Bible itself is a book of holy things. And therefore, if everything that surrounds God is holy, it will be foolish to imagine that an unholy person will get to heaven. Think about it. Those who have left this world and they are in heaven now, they are holy people. There are three people in heaven, bodily, as I'm talking now. If a saint die today, he souls go to heaven, but his body goes to the ground. For thus thou art, and unto thus thou shalt return. But there are three people who did not return to dust. They are in heaven, spirit, soul, and body. And these three people, they were specialists in holiness. The first is Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Next to that is Elijah. Elijah rode in a chariot of fire from this world to heaven. The servant Elijah that was following him, he saw him when no, that chariot came to carry him and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horseman thereof. And then the mantle fell. He took the mantle. So we know Elijah was not buried. He didn't have any burial ground. Enoch didn't have burial ground. They are in heaven, spirit, soul, and body. They live so much holy that God felt, no, their bodies should not see corruption. Their bodies should not decay and return to dust. God took them to heaven. The third person is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he resurrected, he resurrected bodily. And he rose, you know, to heaven. And the people that uh, buried him, they went to the burial ground. And they found out that it was an empty tomb. Think about it. Enoch, Elijah, Jesus Christ. 
the theory of them body lay in heaven and they were all experts in holiness these three people were different in all respects but there is a unifying factor there is a common denominator there is something that is unique and common to the theory of them and that thing is the essential life of holiness that they lived we'll be deceiving ourselves and making mockery of christianity to feel that we can live an unholy life and, to, and we will get to heaven at the end. We'll be making a mockery of Christianity. We'll be deceiving ourselves. And we'll not be speaking the truth to ourselves. If anybody will get to heaven at the end of time, the fadith of scripture, the common testimony of saints, and the uniform testimony of the scripture is that Without holiness, no man shall see God. No man of influence. No man of authority. No man of letters. DD, PhD, SSD. He traveled to Doha. He represented Nigeria when we were talking about science and technology in Atlanta, Georgia. He was uh, the one who uh, was the ambassador to with all the influence and all the letters and all the achievement, without holiness, it will end up in hellfire. And you tell me, what's the importance? What's the benefits of being popular here in this world? Living for 70 years, 80 years, and end up everything in hellfire. God forbid that for you in Jesus' name. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Sanctification is the second work of grace by which the child of God has his heart cleansed of every internal spot or wrinkle and is made pure true and true. Salvation is salvation then is holiness beginning and sanctification is holiness advancing. The moment you repent as a sinner, you confess your sin. Maybe you did that yesterday night. Maybe you did that this morning. Or maybe you are going to do that after this message. Or maybe your own will be tomorrow. If it will not be too late. Or maybe you did your own 10 years ago, 5 years ago. That moment that you repent and your sins are forgiven. And your name is entered into the book of life. Holiness begins for the believer. God does not have an unholy child. But because of the complexity of this world, because of human beings that we are going to interact, and human beings are complex, they are difficult, you are going to encounter, you know, many of them. And because of, uh, especially if you are going to do the work of God, <laughs> and you are going to, you know, human beings, you know, it's easier to even lead cows than to lead human beings. And if you are going to, you know, live in this world and interact and do things, holiness becomes essential. Evidence to you that holiness begins at salvation is a thief on the cross. I mean the thief on the right hand side. Well, because we always associate good to right 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 am i right and if you to left the bible doesn't say it's on the right hand side or whatever but then this thief other thief was says telling jesus if you say you are the savior now save yourself now we are not, we are male factors they were criminals they were suffering legitimately and appropriately for the evil they have committed by fadith of the lifestyle they have lived, they were meant for death by crucifixion. And so, they were to be crucified alongside with Jesus, even though Jesus was just and righteous, but for envy and for the program of God, he was condemned to death by crucifixion. And then that thief 
on the left said, now you say you are savior. If you are savior now, save yourself in this situation, in this circumstance, save yourself and save us. We will now believe you. The thief on the right said, why are you talking like that? Don't you fear God? We are suffering because of our own sin. But this man, for no sin, why don't you fear God? Then he turned to Jesus and said, Lord Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. He repented. He acknowledged his sinfulness. He said we are suffering justly and legitimately. We are sinners. We merit this punishment. This capital punishment imposed on us. We merit it. He acknowledged his sinfulness. Then he repented. And then he surrendered his life to Jesus. He said, Lord Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. What was the response of Jesus to him? He said, today, today, you will be with me where? In paradise. Because he was saved. And as salvation, you have holiness. Salvation is holiness beginning. And because he will not live to live in the world where there are witches and wizards, where there are wicked people, where there are people that will step on your toe on de deliberately, where there are people that will annoy you, where there are people that will, you know, wrong you deliberately and offend you and, you know, make nonsense of your life. Because he will not, you know, be in the, you know, in the, uh, in the, in the campus where, you know, he will attend lectures and then pass a course and then he uh, will go and meet the lecturer and say, excuse me, sir, but I work hard and the lecturer will say, as long as I'm the one offering this course, you can never pass. Maybe because he's demanding for your body and you see, I'm a child of God, I don't do those such things. And he say, okay, sit down there. He, won't, he wouldn't need to go through that experience. But you, you may have to face that. That is why after your own salvation, you will then need to go further for the second work of grace, sanctification. So that you'll be able to cope with the wickedness, with the evils and all that and be able to live a sin-free life in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom we dwell in the world. Then we need sanctification. So we can sustain that holiness that we received at the beginning of our Christian experience. And so... We continue to live for God. These are the things, the requirements of God from every one of us. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Point number two, the total and enduring beauty of a holy life. The total and enduring beauty of a holy life. Psalm 29, I read in verse 2. Psalm 29, I read there in verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord, how? In dancing. Eh? Worship the Lord in burning candle. Eh? Is that what you read here? Worship the Lord with white garments. Is that what you read there? Worship the Lord with, uh, you know, uh, thin breasts and downs and all this, uh, you know, Af Afrobeat music. With, uh, you know, disco music. If you know what people have turned Christianity to, you get to many, many assemblies. And the mode of worship and everything that goes on, you will see this is a Christian alternative to disco party. We are to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We don't worship God with sin. We don't worship God with lust. We don't worship God with covetousness. 
We don't worship God in confusion. We don't worship the Lord in fake prophecy. How do we worship him again? Psalm 96. Psalms chapter 96. I read in verse 9. Who worship the Lord? How? You have not opened? In the beauty of holiness, fear before him. All the hearts. Psalm chapter 15. I read from verse 1 through 5. Psalm 15, from verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Thank God for people who have the mind of God. Here was a king, David by name. The most popular king in Israel. He had everything that art could wish or wish for. And yet, he still had time. He still had time to think about heaven. Here is a question that bothered the heart of David. Lord, who shall I dwell in thy tabernacle? It's not talking about tabernacle of uh, you know more than cement. It's not talking of tabernacle of uh, bricks and blocks. Of course, you know, he has beat that, he has that one. Many tabernacles in the days of uh, David. He wasn't talking about that kind of tabernacle. He was thinking about heaven. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And the answer came from the presence of God himself. In verse 2, he that walketh uprightly. Uprightly means you are doing things the right way. You are not doing wrong. If you are in the wrong, you are not holy. If you are doing right, then you are righteous. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. Nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is, content, is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the law. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. As we read on and on like that, we see that God is a God that dwells in a holy habitation. There is no uncleanness with our God. He cannot, will not tolerate sin. Listen to me. Even if God should waive his condition and allows an unholy person to get to heaven, that man will be a hard man out. Because everything in heaven is holy. Every man, every person in heaven is holy. Everything, you know, it, it, will, be an hard, it will be like a fish out of water. It will be on feet. And that is why he cannot waive this condition of holiness. And brothers and sisters, above all, have holiness of life. What is the use of somebody serving the Lord? What is the use of somebody being a pastor and is popular and is acceptable and uh, everybody respects, everybody cheers him when he's preaching. Everybody, you know, is the toast of everybody in the congregation and at the end, he hands off in hellfire. That's why in this our church, we place a high premium on holiness. Above all, your diet getting. Get holiness. If your service doesn't have holiness, there's no fear of God. If everything is just uh, logic, eloquence, oratory, and uh, you know, crowd pulling ability, you know, and all that, it's useless. It's useless. 
God of heaven that we are serving is a God of holiness. It is when holiness is in your service that that service becomes meaningful. That it becomes acceptable. If there is no holiness, you are on your own. You are wasting your time. You are wasting your time. The, the thief on the left. So if you are the, if you are the save yourself now and save us. He wanted salvation without repentance. He wanted redemption without removing his rebellion. It doesn't go that way. It's not like that. In Nigeria today, everybody is a Christian. Everybody is born again. Everybody is uh, this and that. And all campuses are saturated with religious groups here and there. But what is missing is the most essential element of holiness of life, which is a condition of seeing God. Purity of hearts radiates in the holy character. The holiness God approves of is neither exterior pharisaical correctness nor forced religious legalism. The beauty of holiness runs through the thoughts, the motives, the desires, the interests, the actions of the sanctified. The same blood that saves the sinner sanctifies the believer producing in him the following essential qualities. Number one, initial be of a saved soul. That you find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The moment you are born again, the old lifestyle, the old corruption, the old decay, the old uh, foul language, the old bus conductor language, even the dressing, everything passes away. You don't need anybody to come and teach you during Monday Bible study before you know the right thing to do. Because the Holy Spirit will be witnessing within your spirit, this is wrong. A child of God doesn't do this. This should be corrected. Do amendment here. Correct this one. And so on and so forth. Don't need anybody to sit you down and be teaching you. Of course, coming for Bible study will be an additional, you know, whatever and all that. But the Holy Spirit himself will teach you things to correct, things to make right. All things pass away. We used to sing it. There is a great change since I'm born again. There is a great change since I'm born again, there is a great change. Since I'm born again, there is a great change. Since I'm born again, the things I used to do, I do them no more. The place I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to say, I say them no more. There is a great change. Since I'm born again, oh great change. Since I'm born again, there is a great change. Since I'm born again, there is a great change. Since I'm born again, there is a great change. Since I'm born again, how come then you say you are born again? You are not free from women. How come you are born again? You are not free from lying, from cheating. You are born again. The initial beauty of a holy life accompanies salvation experience. If any man is in Christ, he's a new preacher. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Number two, internal beauty of a sanctified saint. Internal beauty. Rise in the heart. You will des desire righteousness, holiness. You will detest evil. You will hate ungodliness. Look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I read here in verse 1. 2 Corinthians 
chapter 7, reading there in verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The fear of God will constrain you. The fear of God will restrain you. The fear of God will checkmate your actions, your conduct. You can't just do anything anyhow. Because you fear God. Not only that, number three, the incorruptible beauty of a spotless bride. Incorruptible beauty. In Psalm 45, we are told the king's daughter is all glorious within. Number four, the increasing beauty of a steadfast saint. Increasing beauty of a steadfast saint. Because you are steadfast in that holiness, you know, your life becomes more and more beautiful. In Job chapter 17, verse, uh, verse 9. Let's read that. Job chapter 17. I read there in uh, verse 9. Please open your Bible so you can have the assurance. Job 17, verse 9. The righteous also shall so hold on on his way. And he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. If you have clean hands, be stronger and stronger. Puts it in another way. Say, the part of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Number five, the incomparable beauty of a separated soldier. soldier. When, when, you, when you are sanctified, of course, you are separated. Separated from sin, separated from unrighteousness, separated from ungodly friends and godly peers. You separate yourself and then you see that you know, you are not able to do what go places where people go and all that. You are controlled. Holiness and sanctification is possible because God promised it. And Jesus died to provide it. In fulfillment of the promise of God that cannot lie. Every believer that approaches the throne of grace in prayer, consecration and faith shall be sanctified. By the blood of Jesus. Look at that. Hebrews chapter 13. I read in verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13. Reading verse 12. We are for Jesus also. That he might sanctify the people. With his own blood. Suffered without the gates. I pray the suffering of Jesus. Will not be in vain in your life. In Jesus name. That takes me to the last point. The temporal and eternal benefits. Of a holy life. First Timothy chapter 4. I read in verse 8. First Timothy chapter 4. Reading verse 8. For bodily exercise profited little. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Having the promise of the life that now is. And of that which is to come. You see godliness promises you Life here in time and in the world to come. Psalm 101, I read in verse 6. Psalm 101, reading verse 6. Psalm 101, verse 6. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way is I serve me. God is looking for holy people to do his service. He's looking for people who will live in holiness and righteousness. He that loveth pureness, king shall be his heart. Take Daniel for, for example. Holiness made him to become the beloved of God. You can read in the book of Daniel chapter 1, also chapter 9, chapter, and also chapter 10. Therefore, he had an unhindered access to God. He could claim the promises of God and obtain divine guidance very freely. 
Secondly, holiness opens the door into ministry in God's kingdom. If you are holy, you will see that the work of God will just go on smoothly, you know, and smoothly. I remember, you know, a man of God. He had been in a particular ministry before. But later on, you know, came to deeper life. And he became, you know, fervent minister, servant of God, you know, in deeper life. He was sharing with me. He said, when he was, you know, in that other church, that other ministry, that, you know, they also, you know, struggle. They also believe in holiness. They struggle and struggle. It was like the work was difficult to do. But now when he, you know, came to deeper life, he said, it's like you are doing the work of God effortlessly. It's like you are just uh, being carried, you know, by the wind, you know, like that. And uh, why? It was because even though in the former place where he was, they preached holiness, they did everything, but maybe not many people were holy. And that made the door of heaven, you know, to, to close. So at most, opened a little bit. But he said in deeper life, he just sees that uh, it's like things had been done effortlessly here. That is the power of holiness. If you are holy, the work of God, you know, will be smooth for you to do because the moment you call upon God, heaven's doors are open. The moment, uh, you know, you go this way, because you seek the face of God and God will be guiding you. God will be giving you guidance. be giving you, you know, direction. You know, and all that. There was a time I sat and started meditating. And I said, thank God for the man of God in our church. Thank God for the general superintendent. You know, ministers of God have gone to preach in the north and, uh, you know, that all spontaneous reaction just took place. In Kano, in Sokoto, in, uh, you know, all these major, major cities of the north that are, that are hostile, you know, to the gospel. But you know, in that same place, a general superintendent goes there and organizes crusades. And even governors attended. Why? Because heaven's door being open. When he's receiving, when he prays, and God is saying, Now you can go there. Now you can go there. Now you can go this way. And, uh, you know, God is helping. Brothers and sisters, holiness is the answer. Some of us were praying to know the will of God in prayer, and then you knock this door, it's locked. You lock that other door, it refuses to open. We say, what? But some other people, just very easily, you know, they just have it. They pray, and God says, that's the person I have for you in marriage. That's your life partner. And very easily, no trouble, no pain, nothing. And they think just say, you know, go on like that. People asking God, which career, you know, we will like go into and all that. And immediately, God answers and says, go into that. Go into that. And the career that other people are despising. They say, ah, you are going to go and study Yoruba. Ah, Yoruba, ordinary Yoruba. But that's what God told this person, you know, to do. Because he's been born again before, right from the secondary school days. And he's living a holy life. And he goes in for Yoruba. And then, lo and behold, he graduates. And then he becomes a bank manager. He graduates and he becomes a, you know, an NPC, you know, officer. We are asked, the other person is saying, it is messy. He writes jam this year, he fail. He writes jam next year, it doesn't mean they cut off. He writes jam this year. We are asked, the mark that we qualify him for Yoruba, you know, is not as high as uh, the one for mercy. And he keeps on, you know, doing that uh, for mercy, for mercy, you know, and all that. I'm not saying that I'm about we are not mercy is a good profession, but that may not be your own. That may not be the place where you will profit the most. If God directs you to go there, fine. But why wasting time? Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. To see God is not difficult. Just live a holy life, a clean life, a pure life. And you find people graduating, and after graduating, you know, they pray and pray, no job. We are asked, very simply, some other people, they just pray, and God say, go that way. Go that direction. And you see, you know, opportunities opening here and there for them. But because of an uh, idol in the heart, because of unholiness, because of, uh, you know, your own way, because of uh, hardness of heart and all that, and you discover that, 
they pray, it's like there's no answer. They try to open this door, it's difficult. They try to go this direction, there's no way. And uh, it's not as if they've not labor. It's not as if they are lazy. It's not as if they have not struggled. But because of unholiness, they find it difficult to receive guidance from God. And so then, when you are holy, you become a friend of God and the doors of heaven open very easily. By far, the greatest door that holiness opens is the door into heaven at last. That by the time you close your eyes in death, you are ushered into the immediate presence of the almighty God. I pray that will be your portion at last in Jesus' name. So then, in all our days, we must all remember at all times to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's rise up on our feet and go to the Lord in prayer. Holiness, the key that opens heaven's door. You want to see God in your prayer? You want to see God in guidance? You want to see God in leading? You want to see God at the end of time? You want to see God, even in your profession. You want to see God. Holiness is the key. Holiness is the answer. Holiness is all you need. Without holiness, no man shall see the law. Without holiness, no woman shall see the law. Holiness, the key that opens heaven's doors. It's not only heaven's door. It opens all doors. Is the key that opens all doors. The question is, are you holy? Are you pure? Are you sanctified? Are you righteous? Is your Christianity a Christianity of butter and bread? He bought us my bread, he sugars my tea, wonder so so, wonder so so. Is that the kind of Christianity you are practicing? The Christianity of butter and bread? No holiness? No righteousness? No fear of God? Without holiness? No preacher, so I see God. Holiness. The master's master key to the modern super mind. Holiness. Holiness. The essential nature of God that you need in your life. Holiness. Holiness. Are you holding your heart? In your thoughts? In the imaginations that are brewing in your heart? Are you holy? Are you holy in your actions? Are you holy in your reactions? Are you holy in the things that you watch? Are you holy in your speech? In what you say and how you say it, are you holy? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And remember. The starting point is salvation. There is a measure of holiness in the redeemed. When you give your life to Jesus and you are born again, a measure of holiness is deposited in your heart right there and then. Holiness. 
holiness. The passport and the visa for heaven. Holiness. Holiness. The essential nature of God. You have it. If you don't have it, why not? In Jesus' name we pray. Holiness begins at salvation. If you are not born again, you can never be holy. Holiness begins at repentance. And so if you are there, this evening, you want to surrender your life to Jesus. So as to experience, to have the initial experience of holiness. I'll be praying for you before I step down from this altar. Please can I have such people raise up their hands for prayers. You want to surrender your life to Jesus? You want to repent from your sin? You want a deposit of holiness in your life? Raise it up properly. You are raising it to God, not unto man. This is the initial beginning, the initial experience of a purified heart. I'm waiting for you. Well, if you are taking that decision, why not come forward here? I'm waiting for you here. Come forward. Jesus died for you publicly. And you can also receive him into your life publicly. Come forward. The Lord is waiting for you. He will accept you. He will forgive your sin. He will cleanse you from all iniquity. He will purge you from all stains. Come forward. It's a personal decision. Don't look at anybody. It's a personal decision. Between you and God. Between you and God. Between you and God. And tomorrow may be too late. You may not have another chance. This may be the only opportunity that I fail for you. I'm waiting for you now. You are repenting of your sins. You want your sin forgiven. Like the thief on the cross, you acknowledge your sinfulness. And you want your sins to be forgiven. You want your sin pardoned. You want salvation full and free. Come forward, this is your chance. That's why you are here. That's why you are here. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your life. This is why you are here. Without holiness, no man will see the law. Without holiness, no lecturer will see the Lord. Without holiness, no student will see the Lord. Without holiness, no deeper life man will see the Lord. Come forward, come forward. Don't waste time any longer. This is your chance. Those of you that are in the front, just go before the Lord. Ask God for forgiveness. Repent of your sin. Tell him you are sorry. Tell him you will no longer roam in sin. Tell him if he can but save you. You will never go back to your formids. Pray to God. God sees you. He knows your heart. Man look at the outward. But God looks at the heart. Once he can see that condition being fulfilled. Being met right now in your heart. Be sure he's going to save you. And if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Oh, everything becomes new. It will make a new creature out of you. Before I pray right now, this is the last chance. I want to pray. 
I'm waiting for you if you are still there in the crowd. Come and seek the Lord why he can be found. Come and call upon him why he is near. In Jesus name we pray. Heavenly Father we want to thank you. For these ones that have heard your voice. They have seen the stains of sin. They have seen the plague of their own hearts. And they have come forward for cleansing, for purging, for redemption, for salvation. Oh Lord, I pray with the precious blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Blot out their transgression now in Jesus' name. Grant unto them pureness of heart, purity of heart, saintliness of life. Make a brand new person out of every one of them right now in Jesus' name. Lord, blot out their transgression. Cover their sins. Save their soul. Redeem them by your blood. And write their name in the book of life. In Jesus name. The power to go and sin no more. Bestow upon them now. In Jesus name. And among those that will be ushered into the immediate presence of God. At the end of time. Count them in the number. In Jesus name. We thank you Lord for the answer. In Jesus name. We pray. Amen. The second prayer now, if you want your heart purified, you want the second work of grace to be wrought in your heart, you want sanctification experience, God is available. He will do it for you, even right here and now. Can you raise up your hand to signify your interest before the throne of grace? I'm praying for as many people as are discerning that experience right now, and they are offering themselves unto God. Heavenly Father, behold, this your children. Lord, you died for them. And you shed the cross for your blood for them on the cross of Calvary. Lord, the Bible says, Christ also, that he might sanctify the people, suffer without the gate. Let us therefore go unto him, bearing his repro. This one are going unto you. They are coming unto you right now, O oh Lord. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, the sacrifice be found, be, 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 at the gate. O oh Lord, let it atone for their sanctification and heart cleansing right now in Jesus' name. Every defilement in the heart, every impurity in the thought, every plague of the heart. Lord, I pray the cross of Christ will crush them out of their lives and heart in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you will grant them softness of heart, humility of mind, righteousness of conduct. Lord, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, that second work of grace. Right, put it in their hearts and life now in Jesus' name. Blessed are the pure in heart. For days I see the Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus, both here in this retreat and after the retreat, in their hostess, in their, you know, anywhere they find themselves, in time and in eternity. Lord, I pray, all of this one will see you in Jesus' name. Purge them, cleanse them, purify them. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, circumcise the first king of their heart right now in Jesus' name. Make the experience permanent. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. And amen.